So uh, yeah, there's no hope in terms of getting <laughs> momentum here. But um, you know, the, the, maybe the, the one meter place I can compete with Vic is in the circuitous route to the, the present position here or something like that. So if you think he took the long road, I really got started in uh, this area. I'm, I'm as late to the game as you could possibly get on this. Um, and, and it's mostly because I didn't start out really trying to understand positive psychology at all. What I really spent most of my career doing is trying to understand how our everyday life as we live it um, essentially draws forth potential from the human genome. How our everyday as lived changes the way our genome functions inside us. Um, and a lot of people think that that's a, a sort of a strange thing to do. Behavioral scientists say, why are you bothering with the genome? Genomicists say, why are you bothering with everyday life? Um, and so usually I try and answer that question uh, in, in terms of, the, you know, sort of my own, and my, my journey is, is much smaller in drama than fix. But um, it really starts out, and it's certainly more wonky, it starts off with, uh, you know, experiences uh, like data like these. So this is a, a heat plot of gene expression data from a molecular epidemiologic study where we're looking at one of the most toxic environmental risk factors known to epidemiology. Uh, and we're, we're looking at its effect in uh, white blood cells and how it changes the expression of messenger RNA in those cells. And then heat plot rows correspond to individuals, columns correspond to one of about 200 genes that we found in this study uh, differed in their average expression level, about 50% or more, as a function of people's exposure to high versus low levels of this risk factor. And the cells defined by a row corresponding to an individual and a column corresponding to a gene to the extent that they're colored red, that means high expression of that gene in that person. To the extent that they're colored green, that means relatively low expression of that gene. So these organized blocks of green and red are really just telling us there's you know, something on the order of about 70 or so genes that are working differently in our white blood cells uh, when we're exposed to high levels of this risk factor and about 130 or so genes that are sort of down-regulated in activity. Um, and it turns out these 200 or so genes aren't a random smattering of all 20,000 genes in our genome. They actually reflect a few kind of, if you will, sort of coherent clusters or organized conspiracies. So, uh, for instance, prominent among the genes that are upregulated are a block involved in inflammation, which is basically the cell's first line of defense against injury um, and the, sort of the initiation of an immune response. And prominent among the genes that are downregulated are blocks that are involved in actually defending us against intracellular pathogens, things like viruses. So, uh, genes involved in the so called type 1 interferon response, which is the cell's initial response to a a viral infection or uh, genes involved in the production of certain kinds of antibodies. So this kind of coordinated shift in our body's sort of basal uh, molecular stance, if, if you will, wouldn't be particularly surprising if the risk factor that we were looking at in this study were the kind of physical, chemical, or microbial stimuli that I think we all most often worry about in epidemiology, things like uh, benzene in the drinking water or cigarette smoke in our lungs. But what got me interested in this area of work is the, the fact that the risk factor that's structuring these particular differences in gene expression is simply the extent to which the people in the first few rows of that heat plot feel disconnected from the rest of humanity. So it's actually loneliness that's the risk factor that's structuring these differences in gene expression. And for me, as a, a biologist, that was a lot more of a head scratcher. I thought, well, yeah, that's kind of weird. I mean, why would you want you know, this sort of very deep mechanistic portion of our body to be changing its activity as a function of the social circumstances of, of you know, my current life or my everyday life, my lifestyle, that kind of thing. I mean, you'd think these immune cells would be busy, you know, sort of like, I want them out there battling microbes. Why are you worrying about my you know, sort of mental life or social conditions? Or whether I just captured a Pokemon or something. <laughs> So um, you know, we started doing more studies of this kind of thing. And what we discovered is that this particular type of coordinated shift isn't, it turns out, very distinctive to loneliness. As we started looking at a wide variety of other difficult life circumstances, basically what we discovered is any time we're living our lives in a protracted state of uncertainty or outright threat, our immune system will activate those blocks of genes. We see upregulation of pro-inflammatory genes, downregulation of genes involved in antiviral responses. 
Um, and over the last now about 10 years or so that we've been studying these dynamics, we've actually learned a fair amount about why that kind of molecular defense reflex uh, gets instantiated by our experiences in our nervous system. We know uh, a fair amount about which particular cells are involved in this. We know this is all generated actively. It turns out by about 5% of our circulating white blood cells uh, that are collectively called myeloid lineage cells, monocytes, and dendritic cells, if you're into immune cell biology or hematology. Um, these cells seem to be distinctively attentive to our well-being as registered through biochemical representations that essentially filter out of our nervous system and disseminate out through our bodies. Um, and we've been able to map the major pathways that happen, so we now have a pretty clear sense of exactly how that shift in gene expression takes place. It's largely mediated by activation of fight or flight stress responses and the ensuing production of uh, essentially norepinephrine, biochemical signals of feeling threatened or uncertain that register on receptors on the surface of cells that are programmed by our millions of years of evolution to call forth particular blocks of gene expression to activate you know, hundreds of genes that are there in our complement of 20,000 genes and to suppress the activity of other blocks of genes like those type 1 interferons or genes involved in antibody production. So this you can think of as sort of a programmed reflex that apparently we have evolved. It's quite conserved. You can see this in mice. Somebody just did a fabulous study in fish. Apparently way, way back uh, it probably made sense to change the way our immune system works as a function of our transient exposure to threat or uncertainty. Um, and we uh, know a, a fair amount about how psychology plays into this. We know, for example, that the psychology of threat or uncertainty challenge, if you will, uh, looms large in this. That that's what's key to the central nervous system response that pulls for that kind of peripheral neurobiological response. We know, for example, if you had a different psychological reaction to the same external life circumstances or challenges, if instead of feeling threatened or overwhelmed, you felt profoundly defeated and just annihilated by the circumstances that you confront, uh, you would actually generally not activate a fight or flight stress response anywhere near as much. You'd more predominantly produce a hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis response. You'd get more cortisol circulating out into your body. And that, it turns out, would call forth a different pattern of gene expression. So um, if you got the HPA axis activated, it would signal through a different set of receptors that have a similar characteristic of suppressing your antiviral responses, but also intensely suppress your inflammatory responses. So one of the things that we've learned is we've tried to do studies in humans to dissect what's going on in animal models and this sort of thing, and even cell culture test tubes experiments, is that different ways of interpreting and experiencing life generate different biochemical representations that go out into our bodies and call forth these different modules of gene expression. So um, that's you know, sort of the, the, the quick tour through what I've been doing for a, about 10 years. Essentially, you can say, well, I was sitting around in my lab developing some fairly elaborate, screwed down, detailed models of essentially how to convert misery into death, right? So it's like great, you know, it makes sense to the NIH. I can write grants talking about adverse social conditions and how we're going to understand the biology of health risk here. But it's depressing, to tell you the truth. I mean, it's essentially this big recipe for how not to live, uh, both, you know, kind of figuratively in the sense that we're talking about adverse life circumstances, ways that are, you know, not fun, pleasant, generative, uh, anything that we would call, you know, sort of particularly meaningful or helpful, uh, and also literally, because it turns out that these shifts in gene expression leave us, over the long run, more vulnerable to a variety of diseases, particularly that block of inflammatory genes. Those you can think of as essentially sort of great momentary defensive responses, but uh, that, that you know, sort of do their work in a way that unfortunately mortgages our future for our short-term defense. Mm -hmm. And so uh, those molecules, as they're active, are great at initiating immune responses, but they also inadvertently serve as fertilizer for the production of um, metastatic cancers, neurodegenerative diseases, cardiovascular disease. Basically, every major killer of modern epidemiology has, as one of its common components, 
this production of uh, you know sort of inflammatory biology as, as uh, sort of a, you can think of it as a central fertilizer for the disease process. It's not the disease itself. It's just one of the body's resources that helps these diseases come about more quickly. Let's say in a body that's exposed to certain uh, circumstances, lifestyles, that sort of thing. Uh, and it's not awesome to be running around with an impaired immune response either, for that matter. So these are, if you will, kind of inconvenient biological responses given the way we lead our lives now. They once made great sense, but I won't get into too much detail on that kind of thing. Um, so at, at some point, you know, sort of growing in, I have a very high tolerance for negative emotion and depression, but even I, after 10 years of this, was like, okay, is there no redemption in life here? What can we possibly do to uh, you know, live a better way. How can we, uh, you know, essentially be not miserable in a way that's gonna relieve us from this, essentially, this, this kind of molecular soup of death? So I started scanning the, you know, sort of the, the literature. I, I was lucky enough to, to get involved in this and then to, you know, sort of evolve into a kind of a, a little bit of a, essentially sort of a service core and then essentially eventually that grew into kind of like a little hub so people would bring me all of these interesting studies and say hey i want to do genomics in my study of social determinants of health or you know sort of how child soldiers respond to ptsd or all kinds of other things so people bring me these fabulous studies and i'm able to kind of scan through these things and get a sense of which kinds of life circumstances and psychological interpretations and reactions uh, actually register on the genome, which don't. And I, I could start to kind of filter feed through what kinds of, uh, you know, at least in a, in a correlational observational sense, what kinds of favorable or resilience factors might potentially mitigate these kinds of influences. So, uh, you know, that, that led me to start wondering, you know, just at the whole life level, what is it that we, you know, I, I started looking through studies and, and realized, wow, you know, it won't surprise any of you, there's actually very few psychological resilience or well-being factors in most of the studies that were being brought my way. And so that left me wondering, um, you know, sort of more broadly, how I can answer this question. In other words, if we've got this recipe for how not to live, uh, and my big question is how should we be living instead? And so. Um, I, I usually I spend about five minutes explaining. Well, it turns out there's more than one way to be happy, and I deliver this joke where I say I have no personal acquaintance with happiness. So I was amazed that there were two ways to be happy, not just one. Uh, but it, it, we'll, we'll skip that now. So you guys are very familiar with this distinction. This essentially this this you know sort of contest of ideas between this Epicurean perspective of uh, you know sort of fundamental, uh, self-perpetuating, self-gratification, consummatory approaches to well-being versus this more kind of flowery, aspirational, possibly communal, certainly um, sort of goal-driven version of well-being, this more um, kind of a eudaimonic perspective. So uh, the question at hand for me was given, you know, are, are both of these similarly good ways of being not miserable? Is, are, are both great for the genome? Or actually, as is often the case, does the genome just pay no attention to this kind of stuff? It turns out lots of things that we think are true about what matters to our bodies, actually empirically, there's relatively little evidence for. Um, so it, you know, I was, it, it was certainly not a foregone conclusion that we would see any particular pattern of results. But I thought this was important to do because this becomes, if you will, kind of the design target for interventions. And if you would, you would take a very different approach to trying to change life circumstances and hope that filters down to favorable profiles of gene expression if you thought that uh, you know, sort of momentary laughter was you know, a great catalyst for these favorable changes in gene expression. And if you thought that revolutionizing your life and getting back to what's really important is the, the key approach. So this seemed like a, a useful um, question to answer. And so I was lucky enough to bump into Barb Fredrickson at a, a conference and she said, I, yeah, I'm happy to help you do that kind of thing. Um, she's the one that pointed out, you know, which kind of happiness are you interested in? I, I didn't really have any great ideas. So we just essentially went out and used uh, a relatively lightweight, sloppy instrument. To this day, I'm sure Carol just cringes every time I talk about this study because she's like, well, you know, not really the most, uh, you know, sort of sensitive, compelling, uh, you know, sort of uh, instrument for picking up these you know, fundamental concepts. But nonetheless, um, we, you know, had in a, a you know, modest, reasonable size sample, some um, 
white blood cell samples just collected under basal conditions. So these weren't people that were subject to any particular adverse life circumstances. They were free-range human beings from North Carolina. Um, and what we could do is we could kind of look at that profile of adversity-related genes and ask which of these two different types of well-being sort of seems to be best, you know, most antithetical to that. What's what's most inversely correlated? And so we. Um, we took a representative set of genes involved in defending us against viral infections and producing antibodies, that's the specific list there. Another block involved in defending, uh, producing these inflammatory responses. These two gene modules are generally inversely correlated, but they're technically separate. They're regulated by separate um, control pathways. And so usually we look at them in distinction, and so I'm going to so I sort of rotate the axes and flip one of them around in a way where, it was, as I show you results, uh, a vector that generally points up in this space is going to be great in terms of health risk. We're going to be seeing lower levels of inflammatory gene expression and higher levels of type 1 interferons and antibody-related genes. Um, and so what we saw, which, uh, you know, sort of I think would probably please Aristotle, grandmother would probably say the same thing, is that, you know, unsurprisingly, but nice to check empirically, people with relatively high levels of eudaimonic well-being show relatively favorable, um, you know, sort of profiles of gene expression within this space. In other words, they had fairly high levels of antiviral and antibody-related gene expression and relatively low levels of pro-inflammatory gene expression. What was more of a surprise to me was when we looked at high levels of hedonic well-being, and these are each kind of adjusted for one another, or you can see the same thing if you just compute a different score between the two, we found that that was actually associated with a fairly unfavorable profile of gene expression in the space, relatively high expression of pro-inflammatory genes and low expression of these you know, sort of antiviral and um, uh, antibody-related genes. So that turned out to me to be kind of an, an interesting result. I certainly had not expected that thing. Part of the reason this struck me as odd is that when we looked at how not miserable these two ways of being well made you in terms of your conscious affective states, they seemed like they were two similarly good ways of being not miserable. Both were correlated about minus 0.8 with measures of depressive affect or other kinds of negative conscious emotional states. But when we looked at the level of the genome, or if you will, we sort of viewed the distinction between these, these two modes of, of well-being, um, sort of interpreted, if you will, through whatever logic of brain and neuroendocrine representation and transcriptional regulation in immune cells, apparently our cells were coming up with a somewhat different conclusion about whether these were you know, sort of in, indistinguishably good ways of, of being not miserable. And this theme has, has kind of come back to haunt me uh, a fair amount uh, as we've discovered more and more that there's not a terrifically strong mapping between conscious affective states and what the, what you, you might call the automatic uh, non-conscious operating system of our body, which is actually proximally responsible for what our sympathetic nervous systems are doing. There's a surprising degree of disconnect there. It's as if our, our conscious minds were like you know, some little Daryl Bem spacecraft riding on top of, you know, sort of a neck with a spinal column that's kind of doing its own thing. Every once in a while they get together and coordinate, but a lot of the time what is happening in our sparkly conscious experience is, you know, just fast and, uh, and, and highly dynamic relative to the much more sluggish process of delivering these general weather reports out into the rest of our bodies that uh, lead to these very slow changes in large numbers of, of genes activity. So that disconnect struck me as um, pretty interesting. And since that time, uh, Barb was actually a pretty good citizen. So she had already done um, a confirmation study, a replication study, the first one. And we were able to find another observational study that tested this with Carol's much more robust measures of um, psychological well-being, including the purpose and life scale. Since then, uh, as we've looked at this more and more and kind of you know, taken this out of uh, these, these sort of relatively boutique environments, which I think Carol did a great job of talking about, you know, the perils of working from one spatial cultural locale, one particular sort of slice of, let's say, the demographic spectrum, and assuming that this stuff applies everywhere, we've tried to um, sort of 
do variations on this to get a sense of what works or what is the range of maneuverability we have in terms of actually at, at least finding good correlations with these favorable gene expression cohorts, things that might give us a hint about what kinds of interventions or strategies we could engage to you know, sort of push these gene expression profiles in a more healthy direction. So one of the generalization studies took this into the health and retirement study in a small, uh, about 100 person um, pilot study of RNA being collected in that study. And there, um, we were lucky enough to inherit a huge number of other psychometric characteristics that had been assessed. And so we were able to contrast things like purpose in life and uh, the, the, essentially many of the other elements of the, the well-being scales that Carol's pioneered with risk factors and ask, you know, if you kind of put, uh, you know, sort of a linear risk estimate coming out of uh, loneliness, let's say, up against a linear benefit estimate coming out of eudaimonic well-being, which seems to prevail and much to, to my, um, you know, sort of delight, it turns out that you can, you know, basically, it looks like if you can engage this sense of purpose and meaning in life, it's enough to essentially mitigate m much, if not all, of the risk associated with, let's say, feeling disconnected from the rest of humanity. So these are pretty powerful resources in a kind of a, a simple, I'll admit, kind of bullheaded horse race here. This is obviously, you know, it's like partial derivatives in a, in a data cloud space. So it's not like this is a real experiment where we've taken people confronting significant social adversity and made these changes. But it's the kind of stuff that gives you a, a, at least this, this hint that it might be possible for this sort of meaning to uh, sort of override these risk factors that have, have kind of emerged. And then um, relatively recently, Shinobu Kitayama did a, a nice version of this where first he tried it in Japan, which I was delighted to see since there's you know, reasonable questions about how general any of these things are. Um, what, what he did that I thought was also delightful is he took it into the workplace. And it was an especially, I, he, he doesn't really always do justice to the, um, the sort of the anthropology of the workplace that he went into. But basically, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Japanese society right now, it's undergoing this huge revolution where you've moved from workplaces that were highly uh, paternal or familial, actually, even in philosophy, to a very sort of essentially Marxist commodified view of labor that characterizes Western employment markets. So you're having people who have for years been, you know, sort of in this deep social contract with a big organization fulfilling some kind of mission of service to your fellow countrymen or your customers throughout the world. And now these people are losing their jobs like crazy. So as you might imagine, this is a highly fraught, you know, highly uncertain, fairly threatening environment. And uh, what we saw was, yeah, actually, you know, it looks like these are some pretty stressed bodies, even though these are otherwise relatively healthy, middle-aged, you know, workers at a, a very successful Japanese IT firm. Um, and what you find in this study is that above and beyond just your general level of eudaimonic well-being, you might call it your generic purpose in life, having a strong investment in or identification with or even an ability to articulate the mission of your organization, your workplace, and the role that you play in contributing to the success of the organization at all turns out to be quite surprisingly buoyant in terms of these gene expression profiles. So I think it definitely speaks to what we were discussing earlier about the significance of work and collective engagement. Um, and this, I, I, uh, earlier today, I remember someone very distinctly saying there was a uh, big association between whether people could articulate the purpose or goals of the organization they worked for or who, you know, sort of how they were contributing to that overall mission. And that was certainly registering in this particular study. Um, since that time, also some fabulous epidemiological studies have come out. So uh, earlier, we heard about the site science study. That's one of my favorite developments since uh, you know, when we produced this eudaimonia and gene expression paper, there was a lot of nastiness that came our way. And so I was privately you know, like, gosh, did we get something wrong here? You know, like we were just trying to work out biological pathways for, you know, sort of reasonable epidemiological results. Nobody could get so mad. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's nice to see people come along in, in other data sets and say, no, it's, it's there. You know, it's like, regardless of whether you think about this as a molecular event, it's certainly an epidemiological event. 
Um, and subsequently, Andrew Steptoe came out with another, essentially even more independent study, partly because, you know, A, he's doing this in the UK, and B, he's, you know, he, he's into positive psychology, but he doesn't have a big horse in the race of whether uh, purpose in life turns out to be a fabulous, you know, sort of um, resilience factor or a fabulous risk-reducing factor in epidemiology, and that he saw it quite clearly. So I'm reasonably persuaded that there's really something there and really something there to be understood. Somehow, if you're dying, you know, there's probably some biological underpinning of that. And trying to understand what that is and what we might do about it seems like a worthwhile project. So that's what we've been doing since then, is trying to figure out how we get essentially eudaimonic well-being into this pathway. So one of the things that is, um, you know, sort of annoying is that, you know, this pathway is pretty well conserved negative psychology henchmen, um, you know, sort of neurophysiology. There's, there, we have not been able to find any juice circulating through the body that represents your degree of hedonic well-being, much less your degree of eudaimonic well-being. Um, you know, and we know very clearly from drug studies that it's definitely the fight or flight system and the beta adrenergic receptor transducing signals from norepinephrine. So we can knock out all, you know, we can stress animals, we can stress monkeys, we can stress people. All of these things produce that genomic reflex that I talked about um, without, you know, so there, there doesn't seem to be any sort of positive neurobiology that's kind of directly talking to the cells and saying, hey, don't listen to the beta adrenergic receptor or something like that. So what I've been trying to do... Single bold scotch, is it? <laughs> <laughs> that's a, that, a, an exogenous stimulus I didn't rule out. <laughs> I'm, I'm not resisting the particular experimental intervention that you nominated here, but so far our IRB has not seen fit to uh, okay that one to go. So how is it that if, you know, fight or flight biology is really what's orchestrating these gene expression profiles at the proximal level within these cells, where is it that, you know, this, essentially this eudaimonic um, influence blocks that kind of dynamic if it's not carrying its own biology out here that, that you know, sort of blocks at the level of the cell? So there's two broad theories that we've pursued in this regard, and they actually correspond to, you know, sort of some of the discussion points that we've had earlier. Um, one theory is that there is perhaps something, and there's undoubtedly something uh, deeply biological about the way that humans and in fact all animals are pro-social. Um, and the, the theorists, and this is a nice book by Patricia Churchland where she articulates this idea very well, that uh, essentially um, sort of deep in our mammalian history as we started having progeny that were a little bit more tabula rasa and didn't just like hit the ground with instincts and start behaving. They had to learn what the world was like. They had to learn to interact with others around them. That you developed uh, a complementary need on the side of the, the people delivering these babies to take care of them and help keep them alive while they were learning this stuff and help instruct them in kind of how to grow up and, and be a functional organism. So this idea posits that there are these fundamental caregiving uh, affordances in our nervous systems, and that these, while originated uh, for essentially mother-child, um, you know, sort of bonding and all of the sort of induction and maintenance of that, end up being generalized. And that much of what is distinctive about humans is this ability to generalize essentially um, sort of caregiving systems that were originally directed at infants to, let's say, spouses and our local community members, maybe to abstract notions of a nature, a nation, or a culture, or a cause and in the grand sense. So one of the things that people who study this kind of caregiving system have noticed is that it has a, a, a sort of a distinctive biological, essentially bliss mechanism to it, both in terms of its CNS biology, um, and in, it turns out in terms of per peripheral physiology. So one of the people who is most prominent in this area is Steve Porges, who points out, he's the, if you guys don't know him, he's a big theorist of the vagus nerve and the parasympathetic nervous system. And his idea is that this system really went through a significant structural elaboration specifically to afford this kind of deeply um, you know, sort of synergistic bonding experience that you need to raise human babies or actually primate babies more broadly. So uh, the vagus nerve and this whole parasympathetic nervous system as we remember from you know, sort of college physiology 101 or psychobiology, wherever we got exposed to it, 
one of the few things that has any kind of notable inhibitory power over the sympathetic nervous system in our bodies is the parasympathetic nervous system. So one possibility is that when people are engaged in eudaimonic pursuits, they are activating uh, pro -so fundamentally pro-social neurobiological systems that at the peripheral physiological level have some degree of inhibitory veto power over the activation of these threat-related signaling pathways. Um, so that's, that's one general possibility that we're looking at. I'm not going to claim that we have much data one way or the other on that. I'll show you a little bit of what we have, but it's still early in the game. So this you can think of as the point at which I fell over the edge of the waterfall in terms of data. Everything up until here is you know, reasonably close to the empirical world. Uh, now we're starting to get much more kind of theoretical and conceptual. So that's one major concept that specifies essentially an intrinsically pro-social but biologically manifested um, component of meaning or purpose, whatever you want to call it, that is you know, able to intervene in this threat-related biology out in the periphery. The other major idea that we've been looking at is one that Vic has actually been championing quite well, which is that we, we know something about how the brain originates these fight or flight stress responses, particularly in threat or uncertainty uh, regions such as the amygdala and other components of the, the you know, sort of, if you will, sort of the brain stem proximal um, sort of circuitry that runs our emotional systems. They, they're the major drivers of this outflow, but we also know that there are uh, closely allied brain circuits that are focused on engagement, focused on goals, on seeking, is what Jacques Pancept calls it, um, these hope-driven systems, things like the ventral striatum, which they gave you a, a quick introduction to. So the ventral striatum, you can think of as not, is so much a reward center. There's a temporal distinction between sort of reward and wanting. Classical versions of reward systems were systems that get activated after you get something good, and it becomes sort of the internal version of your reinforcer. Um, the neurobiologists who specialize in ventral striatum say, you know, what's funny about it is it's most active before you get your reward. It's not what activates after your reward, it's what keeps you chasing after the reward in the first place. So it's kind of a, a hope or a striving or a wanting thing uh, instead of, let's say, a, a liking center in your brain, or it's a prospective liking center. So in a couple of studies recently, we've begun to look at how individual differences in reactivity in these types of brain circuits correlate with individual differences in these basal gene expression profiles. So all of us are all the time sort of raising or lowering the temperature on that threat-related uh, gene expression profile, but that's changing relatively slowly. Most of us have a relatively stable set point. So um, it's reasonable to ask, and you know, our initial intuition would have been, wow, you know, individual differences in amygdala reactivity should correlate pretty tightly with what we see happening in the leukocyte transcriptome. Um, and of course, once you produce a confident prediction like that, this is inevitably what ensues. <laughs> so what, what bailed us out of, you know, this sort of, you can imagine we were not that excited when we looked at that, but things broke <laughs> up and we started looking at the ventral striatum, we're like, that's just ridiculously strong relationship between how reactive people's ventral striatum is. Basically, this is the nucleus accumbens, so for those of you for whom these distinctions actually matter, this is, you know, sort of the kind of the, the key driver here. Uh, you see similar kinds of things, but easier, less easy to resolve in caudate and putamen. Nucleus accumbens, particularly strong effects. So uh, what's interesting, and, and speaks further to what Vic was talking about earlier, is the manipulation we use to prime these uh, systems, the probe task, because that's the whole art of MRI, is not can you scan a person's brain, it's can you tweak their experience the right way while you're doing that to selectively engage the neural circuitry that you're interested in. So the amygdala task, the amygdala priming task is pretty straightforward. Probably most of you are familiar with it. You just show people faces that are angry or hostile. Um, so pretty kind of standard task for this. The ventral striatum task, flat out value affirmation. It's basically exactly what Vic was talking about earlier. So you get people to, you know, you basically list the values that they really care about, and then you, you basically prime them somehow. You get them to think about them and process them, and how much more uh, ventral striatal activity you have under those circumstances versus um, a neutral control condition or a negative control condition becomes the, the parameter that you're basically plotting here as kind of the VS activation number. 
So there appears to be a pretty deep connection between this seeking or wanting circuitry in the central nervous system and these gene expression profiles in the periphery. So that's led us to become, uh, you know, sort of a little bit more confident in the idea that uh, you might actually be able to push around gene expression profiles by, you know, manipulating these kinds of uh, eudaimonic experiences, either just in terms of generic goal seeking, it's quite unclear to us right now whether that's sufficient at the biological level, or whether you really need this kind of pro-social engagement, this activation of caregiving systems. Uh, fortunately, most of the time, those two things are reasonably well confounded, and that may end up in the context of our discussion of the moral dimensions of this kind of thing, but they are dissociable. So I know, for example, if I want to activate the nucleus accumbens, I can also get people to do gambling tasks or play video games. Those are both fabulous ways of stimulating this. Neither of them, you know, sort of very proximally, directly pro-social. You can make up a story about how I'm gambling for the well-being of my family, but that's not usually kind of what is really the effective psychology. So um, the, the first opportunity we had to look at this um, just wrapped up maybe about six months or so ago when um, we persuaded Sonia Lubomirsky at UC Riverside, who's a, a noted happiness expert, to uh, essentially sort of uh, extend and expand one of the studies that she'd done a few years back where she had people go out and do essentially random acts of kindness for other people. So you would do three of them a day, I think maybe on one day uh, per week for four weeks or something like this. So she randomized people to, these were you know, basically, again, kind of free range UC Riverside adults, uh, probably about half of them college students, maybe some of them college employees, and you know, others of them just people who wander through campus, stuff like that. And they were randomly assigned to either perform random acts of kindness for a specific other individual, like find somebody and do something nice for them, which is great, that seems very pro-social, and there's all kinds of room for what some of the positive psychology people think is the most important part of this, which is bounce back. They think that at least one of the plausible theories is that doing good, if I do something good for Vic, what's really rewarding is when Vic says, Steve, I really appreciate that, or, or he just looks happy, and I kind of self-reward around that kind of thing. So this idea of a real, concrete, helped person, um, you know, in, in some theories, pretty critical. Another version of this is, Something more abstract uh, in which I'm doing something good for the world around me, but not necessarily for a particular individual. And so the instructions for this really encourage people to go save the whales or, you know, sort of meditate for the betterment of mankind or something like that. Um, it, ideally, with, you know, as, as minimal as possible direct feedback from a helped person. And then, uh, you know, sort of a reasonable control condition, do random acts of kindness for yourself. Go, uh, you know, I don't know. Remember what that would be, even a parent. Whatever. Once, once upon a time, when I, I had, you know, when my brain actually worked, I would I recommend the grandparent thing too, to tell you the truth. But the um, the notion there is we might be able to control for general just hedonic experience. We know that eudaimonic experiences automatically beget hedonia. In fact, one of the ways of thinking about the correlation between these two is just different pathways to hedonic well-being. Some coming through eudaimonia, others coming through consummatory self-gratification. Uh, so, you know, sort of thinking of them as necessarily lateral, it, you know, sometimes when you get into the semantics, it's not really clear that actually makes that much sense in exactly the way he was, he was talking about earlier. And then, of course, a control condition that's sort of more neutral, where there's no uh, extra happiness burden to be borne by anybody. You're just, let's say, tracking your activities, which is what they ask people to do in the other conditions as well, so we can figure out whether people are actually adhering to the prescribed protocol and get some opportunity to code the nature of the things that they do. So, um, you know, with that set up, I'll show you what we found. Uh, for, for all of you who are into, you know, sort of extreme symbolic aspiration, sorry, we didn't find a lot of evidence that in a kind of a pretest to a, a post-test change, so pretest before these protocols start, post-test about a week to two weeks after their fourth week of random acts of kindness. If those random acts of kindness were uh, you know, sort of being directed toward the world in general, but, uh, you know, sort of mostly not toward a particular individual. We didn't see any very dramatic reduction. In fact, we saw no point estimate of reduction at all in these adverse gene expression profiles. But when we looked at people who were performing random acts of kindness for specific other individuals, they actually show pretty favorable changes in gene expression. Um, so pretty, pretty notable. 
uh, relative to the you know, sort of range of normal variation, this would be about maybe a 0.4 standard deviation effect size or something like that. People who did random acts of kindness for the self didn't show any statistically significant change from baseline. Maybe they were trending a little bit in the adverse direction, so possibly that's somewhat maybe sort of analogous to what we were seeing with the hedonic well-being in some of those earlier studies, but that's you know, also an equation that might be more of a stretch. But to make a long story short, this, it turns out, we had um, you know, sort of collaborated with Sonia on an earlier round of this study to make sure that doing random acts of kindness for other people actually did change measures of eudaimonic well-being, and sure enough, it did. So it, you know, this, in terms of a, an operationalization you know, sort of validity check, this, this seems to be a way of manipulating eudaimonic well-being. Whether that's all that it's doing, or even kind of what we mean by the perimeter of eudaimonic experience, and, and you know where would you draw the line in terms of its social, pro-social, moral components, uh, more ambiguous. But nonetheless, at least we've got some kind of a protocol that we can activate that will change some of these things. So uh, this distinction between um, what you might call goals in the abstract and seeking. Uh, and this notion that the content of the goal, the moral or the ethical or the interpersonal pro-social content, um, is, I think, for me, one of the most interesting questions. We know, like I said before, that we can see activation of this ventral striatal system, even when you're not doing especially pro-social stuff, but we also know that pro-social things are one of the best ways to activate this system. So um, that you know, becomes the, the, one of the, the major things we're trying to sort out as time goes on by engaging as many different eudaimonia-producing uh, protocols or interventions as we can. So there's a, a really nice rendition of this, this distinction written by this uh, UK journalist, a guy named Will Storr, who was um, interested in this whole domain, uh, and especially what, what I call kind of the, the kind of probably not the most brilliant thing I've ever done, but I, originally I called it the Usain Bolt question. So this was before the Olympics. Uh, for people who know Usain Bolt, that guy loves to run fast. He, he, you know, he basks in adulation, but everybody who knows him says he's just gonna run fast even if no other human being existed. That guy really loves to run fast. He's really good at it. And he, it's the same thing as I climbed the mountain because it's there. So he has this very, very strong, essentially endogenous, reward system. So when he, and, and he suffers for this, it's not easy to run that fast. He makes it look easy, but you know, he still has to train like crazy. So he's, you know, he, he's a good case study as, a, as kind of a mental model for what we would think about as the, you know, moderately extreme, uh, but not highly pro-social version of eudaimonia. In other words, it's not uh, highly immediately consummatorily self-gratifying to train that hard, to eat the way he has to eat, to do all this kind of stuff. It, it's a fair amount of suffering, and yet the glory is worth it for him. So the, the question at hand is, you know, if Usain Bolt is running mostly just because he thinks this is awesome, and that's what he wants to achieve, is he gonna have the same kind of benefits as somebody who was doing this in this more random acts of kindness, pro-social, help other people kind of thing? So that's sort of the, the to be determined question, or at least one of the, the many to be determined questions at this point. So uh, that's you know, basically, I think, all I've got to, to you know, talk to you guys about. You'll understand more why I'm interested in all this great stuff that you guys are doing. You'll also understand why I don't understand it very well, because I'm just like some random genomics guy who wandered into the <laughs> um, But you know, I'm pretty persuaded. That I, I can tell you, I have not seen anything else in all of the stuff that I filtered through on the positive side of life that can hold a candle to eudaimonic well-being in terms of either the effect sizes or the consistency of the effects at cross gratification studies. So I personally think it's probably about the most promising thing out there. And what I want to know is how can we make more of it? And so I'm delighted to learn all about that stuff from you guys. Thanks for your attention. said you had unexpected criticism. To, to make a, a long story short, there's a lot, positive psychology turns out to be far more of a snake than I had ever <laughs> <laughs> um, And 
I, so there's an illegitimate part of this that just comes from the competitiveness and nasty spitefulness of the academics and other people that they interact with. That, I have to say, is the biggest nuisance on the whole thing. But uh, at some point, I actually harbored the fantasy that there might be something principled in some of these, and mostly just as a thought exercise, like, can I show some sense of generosity to people who are mercilessly criticizing what we're doing and trying to get our papers retracted and, you know, harassing us online and all that. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, as as Jeff, as Jeff Higgins will tell you, where she was still in my lab, when I came across the slab of Chicole, and published that in, like, respected mm -hmm. clinical, some, well, well, I forget the name of the journal it is. It was, uh, but it was an APS journal that we published. You remember, I walked, I said, guys, we need to study this, and then I've been following your work ever since. I, I, I don't see, maybe I'm naive, I just, I am naive. I just don't see why. Well, I'm happy because there's a long paper trail of, uh, you know, yeah. but the, let, let's not dwell on that. Okay. okay. There, there actually is a principled, um, you know, sort of reason to, to think about this or to be queasy about it. Um, and it has, I think, a little bit to do, well, actually, as, as you were discussing, with culture and this notion that especially as, you know, sort of Western secular cultures have evolved, we've become very uncomfortable with connections between ethics or morality and health and well-being. Health and well-being has actually, in an odd way, trumped, um, you know, a lot of dimensions of moral virtue. So now people do stuff because it's healthy or because it makes them healthy. My wife is a diabetes educator, and she runs around all day long trying to make people healthier. And it wasn't working when she was trying to get them to be healthier. When she turned the corners, when she said, you know, why should you even live? And people started saying, yeah, that's a good question. Why do I want to live? And then started answering the questions. And then, to, you know, this is exactly what Vic has been on for five years, is if you can get people health in its own right, as most people actually experience it, not cognitively, but that sort of viscerally, is only a second order good. Health helps you run a body to do good stuff in the world, to make things, to find things, to help people to be special. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's, you know, but, but this notion that health has a value and that, and Vic and I were talking about this before, you know, that happens, that, that's on the ascendance at the same time as Western civilization goes through this crisis of modernity where we've largely lost faith in reason's ability to validate our highest aims. So it's not terribly clear why we should do most of the stuff that we actually do as humans, at least if you run a logic map. Now, if you're Patricia Churchland, you go, well, let's think about this evolutionarily and what actually works in terms of creating organisms that are like the way we are. There's, there's a fabulous, it turns out, um, evolutionary case for this kind of thing. But evolution is a book of uh, uh, Watson and Edie in, in uh, uh, Lucy, the, the uh, Beginnings of Humankind mm -hmm. in 1981, that was very reminiscent. I haven't read her book, but it's, it's very reminiscent of what yeah. Johansson, you know, the, Lucy, the uh, yeah. Homo Yes. Yeah. 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 And so this is, you know, the, Vic and I have a fabulous time talking about this because this is exactly what we've been sort of contending with is like the value of health. So the ventral striatum is mostly about value not yet acquired, or value to be achieved or something like that. So we know we've got to get this one right because that's where the traction is going to come from. If you want to change behavior over the long run, you're not going to be able to scare people into it. You have to get them to want something that this good behavior is on the path toward. That's how we sell cars these days. That's what all of modern marketing is about. They got it right. And we're, you know, as behavior change interventionists may be a little bit late to the game, but purpose is a good way of, of you know, sort of conceptually codifying what it is that our agenda is in terms of long-term behavior change. So this, this, this collision between moral virtue and, and you know, sort of health and well-being makes some people uncomfortable. They feel like, wow, that's very judgmental. Uh, that's very, you know, sort of uh, coercive. So I, there's a way in which we could potentially accidentally have stepped on a nerve that um, is sort of culturally salient right now. And I think even if you, you don't necessarily focus everything on the ascendance of health as a value, there's still this, this, this notion that we're, we, I'm trying to think of a good way to talk about this. I should just give up and let Vic answer this because he's thought about this you know, more than I have. Well, I was just words for simply it. going to say the biologist Franz Duval has worked really hard to study altruistic behavior in bonobos, chimpanzees, elephants, dolphins, 
whales, a whole right. group. And in fact, in rats, even they exhibit very altruistic behavior. They'll open a door within a plexiglass cage to allow another rat out to share chocolate chips. I mean, things like that. That's pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. And there's probably an evolutionary reason for that kind of sharing. Uh, you know, and, and in fact, I would have predicted exactly what was found with the uh, RNA uh, expression, with that expression of uh, inflammatory cells. When you're giving to the world, to some unknown group, that's, that's a group that you don't know who it is genetically, whereas if you're giving something to someone you know, it's almost giving, it is giving someone to in your gene pool. Yeah. Right. And so that's probably selected for, yep. you would think. Yeah. So, you know, who, who, th there is a version of this that makes sense and is reasonable that's, that's, you know, completely eligible for civil debate. Civil debate has been notably lacking from this kind of stuff. There's yeah. very little, you know, yeah. sort of elevated, illuminated consideration of this kind of stuff. But, you know, Carol has been through much the same thing as she tried to put, you know, this whole notion of eudaimonia on the in the world of, quote, real things in terms of operationalizing this. Before that, you know, what she was all about, what she's articulated so beautifully and is so obviously central to what we're doing was, you know, off the radar because it hadn't been operationalized and getting it on the radar, you know, there was I, you know, probably a surprising degree of pushback and acrimony as well. It's a statement. Todd, you had a question? Oh yeah, um, so Steve, because I, I haven't read your papers in a while, so, um, but now that I'm looking at the visual of the relationship between eudaimonia and the hedonics and the, the different uh, genomic expression, um, help me understand, because you co-vary the other one out for each one of those, and because I tend to think of, the way I always think about things is think of humans, not variables. Mm -hmm. So when you r remove the variants for hedonics for eudaimonia, and vice versa, like what does that look like for it? The easiest way to think about it is not to think about removing variants, because that turns out to be something that none of us can really understand, and to your point, that's not a real human being. The best way to think about it is in terms of the difference between these two variables. So you can measure hedonic well-being, you can measure eudaimonic well-being, and on any given scale, you can compute the, the difference between those two things. So the people that show the adverse gene expression profiles are the people who have comparatively high levels of hedonic well-being mm -hmm. and comparatively low levels of eudaimonic well-being. So the person who is that exemplar is somebody who's pretty happy, but they're essentially saying this is not coming mostly from uh, pro-social or a goal or you know, any of this, this kind of eudaimonic psychology. Uh, they're not telling us where it actually does come from, so this, the excess of hedonic well-being has some attribution, it has some unpacking, but it's, it's, it, that's not very well defined. But the presumption is that's just like watching TV and, and you know, gluttonously consuming tasty food and stuff like that. But there's a lot of versions of hedonic well-being that are, you know, beautiful epicurean experiences, like just, you know, mirthful laughter, spending time with people that you like. There's all kinds of ways of being simply happy without striving or struggling or in this kind of goal, you know, sort of directed way. So I'm a little bit uncertain about the other path to hedonic well-being and exactly how best to characterize that. There may be multiple other paths, but the best we can say is the person who shows the adverse gene expression profiles is somebody who feels, you know, sort of essentially affectively quite positive, but reports relatively low levels of hedonic well-being. Does that basically make sense? You can think of it as a racial variable. Another version yeah, no, is the person who's relatively well. It's, it's different in the papers, right? In the, in, when you're in, in the papers, you describe it very differently than that. I, I love the way you just described it there. Because you create, you basically created two different profiles of people, right? In kind of an unusual sort of way. But does that make sense? That, which means that there's a huge middle ground territory of characters that are not captured. Well, we treat it as a continuous variable. So yes. there, there is a middle ground of people, um, and then there's, there's people, what we almost never see, which is interesting for the positive side people, we almost never see people who have extremely high levels of eudaimonic well-being compared to hedonic. In other words, if you've got a lot of eudaimonic well-being, it's going to return hedonic well-being to you. Somebody else mentioned that in the study, too. Right? Yeah, well, he, he was articulating. I, mean, I, think, I think you're exactly right. I think that there is 
a fundamental positivity. I, I, in all of the analyses, we've always reported this rotative analysis where we look at the sum of the two variables, which is essentially what they have in common, their average, and the difference between the two variables. And that's the one that's most reliably associated with gene expression. When you do that, the difference is the most strongly correlated parameter, and the sum, what they share in common, has zero correlation. I think that sum is the genetics of positive affect. And the difference is something about life and how you live it. And now I, I, you know, I stand for correction. Yeah, not a correction, no. I was just going to say uh, it's useful to bring some sociodemographic variables So in that first uh, paper, we published from the Mines baseline data to basically try to look at whether hedonia and pneumonia are distinct. Uh, one, one of the things that we found was that you can define using sociodemographic variables age and educational status. You can define two subgroups who show comparatively high levels of one not the other. Okay, so what, what are those subgroups? Where do you see comparatively high levels of hedonic well-being but low hedonic are older, less educated adults? And where do you see comparatively high levels of eudaimonic but low hedonic are highly educated young adults? Mm -hmm. Which I translated as graduate school. <laughs> <laughs> You know, where you are really striving. I mean, we, we can all relate to, you know, periods in life where you're for sure really purpose driven, and it's not translating to a lot of short term hedonic gratification. I mean, although, I mean, I think the argument, you know, the deepest, I think, uh, meanings and purposes and goals, when you see progress happening in them, or profoundly dominant, but a lot of times you're, that's not where you are. You're struggling with it. Kevin, you know what's great about, see, this is why I like turn to human value variables, is when you do that, you see the importance of having a temporal span where, versus the snapshot, right, using a grad school example, which is basically, it's, it's the bar mitzvah bond again, right? So the idea is the payoff's coming 15 years down the road, where all of a sudden you have this great autonomy and great security and then you can travel around the world and kind of meet cool characters and, and do things. So it'd be interesting to see if that's the gene expression in the snapshot, what does it look like if you capture that group? If that group is, that those groups where it's high, high demonia and then low hedonics, mm -hmm. what does it look like over the course of time? We'll probably just extrapolate from grad students. You can, you can have this kind of very kind of cool and very question. You, you said, Steve, that when you look at temporal stability in, in, the, in the gene expression profiles, they're fairly stable. That so the basal profile is fairly stable. Yeah. There are things like, you know, I have a cold or a flu or a food yeah, poison yeah. that will lead yeah. to these crazy spikes. Um, but by and large, assuming that your life has not changed dramatically, yeah. then yeah, there's pretty good stability. So and they're actually sluggish. That's, so. that's why having this agenda in long-term longitudinal studies like HRS and like MIDAS is so valuable because things really are happening in people's lives that we are tracking over time so that you could maybe begin to actually identify subgroups where you might actually see some shift that is tied in meaningful ways to stress exposures, chronic problems that have cropped up. Yeah, well, and it's, you know, the chronicity is basically the architecture of health psychology risk factors. So we used to worry a lot about acute life events, but that has been a major empirical failure. What matters most in terms of epidemiological outcomes, people actually getting sick and dying, often, oddly enough, are measures that are taken either directly of your outside ecosystem or your perception of your ecosystem. Um, I'll tell you, measures of subjectively experienced stress almost never correlate with any of this stuff. So that's an example of where your head is experiencing something that doesn't necessarily correspond very well to what's going on in your body. And then there was this question of what really is stress in that case. And so we almost banished that word so that we always force ourselves into either talking about there's a threat response biological system doing something, uh, which you can think of as like run by the operating system of your body. 
which we're discovering now, this is not you know, particularly my invention. Joel Ledoux's done a great job of articulating, you know, even at the level of fear and anxiety, there's a conscious system and there's a, a threat defense automatic operating system that's working largely outside of conscious experience and it's approximately responsible for controlling the autonomic nervous system and lots of other stuff. And those two things don't necessarily match up well, mostly because our cognitive systems are really fast and extremely, um, you know, sort of complex and reactive, whereas our biology is comparatively slow. So our brains can get way, way out in front of things, uh, and they're very sensitive to change, whereas our biology, it seems like, and most of our brainstem, is mostly tracking what's similar about today relative to yesterday. That is, like, all of these days, I'm living in a crazy environment where you can't trust anybody. But our conscious minds think, oh, that's just the same as yesterday. So that's normal. I'm going to pay attention to what's different today. So our conscious minds are much more reactive and kind of temporally volatile than are these kind of brainstem operating system things that are much more kind of averaging out over time and end up being empirically more strongly correlated with things like poverty and PTSD and all that kind of thing than, are, than they are with conscious affect, nor is conscious affect. It turns out terribly, terrifically well correlated with a lot of these ecosystem variables. So it's a weird thing where you would expect the psychology to mediate between the ecosystem and the biology but that's, I feel more the exception than the rule. I can jump in also. I want to um, uh, ask you a question if I could figure out about your work. Um, I just, I appreciated both talks so much and I'm liking the sort of the ability to go back, back and forth mentally between both the two things you just heard. Um, I like how you stress the bi-directionality between this technology and the app and the theory of purpose, how we can learn a little bit by both. and and. I really attracted the idea of learning what purpose is and what it can do by how what the app allows people to uh, reveals to us. And so I had a question about this. And you, you raised the point about the different ports people might the, the yeah, right, different the, domains. So domain, domains, domains of purpose that they that they could pull their line to, and that creates different arcs and curves for different individuals. Um, I guess my question is a couple maybe two fold here. Is one. Do you have any data on how the shape of that arc or the way people pull their lines to certain domains corresponds with well-being as you're picking it up within person in the app? Have you looked at it? Do you have the data and have you looked at it? Um, and if not, do you have, I want to invite you to speculate, do you have any ideas about what should happen there? Because it, it answers an interesting, potentially answers an interesting question about purpose, yeah. of whether or not a singular life aim is beneficial or differentially beneficial than having these potentially competing life aims that you're organizing yourself around. Yeah, I pulled a few slides just because of length because there's kind of a debate about that, really. Mm -hmm. Stuart Friedman is uh, at the Wharton School of Business. He's an organizational psychologist, very bright. And he's divided uh, people's lives into these four domains. Uh, I didn't use it. it. It was just kind of weird to see he had come up with the same thing. It's not rocket science. But he's written a lot about how people who have those four domains covered are more productive and, and things like that, and how there are conflicts. But he has a very different approach to doing that. He says, you know, he suggests bringing your kids to work, um, which somebody did here, which is awesome. I used to do that myself. Or tell your children how your work is so meaningful to you and potentially to them down the road. There are a bunch of ways he suggests. Um, there are other people that suggest that you should focus all of, and in fact, he does. He, he says, if you care more about work, weight that more high, strongly. Imagine a unified purpose variable that is based on weights that you've given those four domains. Mm -hmm. And maybe many of us would give our family 70% and our work, or maybe our work 70%, whatever it is. And we could do that in the app and then come up with a unified measure and how aligned you are and what relates to that aligned measure. But I was just listening to an Aspen Ideas Festival talk with David Brooks and Arthur Brooks, who runs the American Enterprise Institute. He said, this is a portfolio. You, just like in financial well-being, you need to be well attend attending well to all four domains. I have no idea. So it's a fun thing to speculate, and it does have direct relation with how we would build the app. 
Um, I, you know, just uh, parenthetically too, this app is not meant to be the new Jerusalem. It's just one tool. I think there will be many tools out there down the road that will be exciting, fun to see, and from different dimensions. Some teaching in classrooms. You see, you know, the new design your life with Bill Burnett's work, and you know that's one approach to doing this. There. This is a tool. I think that our tools in wellness and well-being pretty much are like doing surgery with stones. And it's, they're not good tools, especially ones that need to scale rapidly at low cost. And I'm in public health, so we need to scale to millions of people at very low cost. And this is the type of tool that I would hope we could deliver to 41 million AARP members or you know hundreds of thousands of college students, things like that. And then look at exactly the kinds of things you're talking about and do various trials. Let's try it this way versus that way. That's one of the reasons I was excited about talking about this to this group. Richard? So first I want to thank you uh, for sh sharing your personal story which transformed, I mean it was heroic how you transformed this tragedy that has all very moved into something that could really affect millions of people positively. So I want to thank you. And I hope thank someone you. who has access to like the New Yorker profiles you because I, I just it's really a heroic thank story you. and it's very helpful. So thank, thank you. you. I appreciate that. I, I have a question though that's very Monday data analysis. Okay. Yeah. Sorry to go no go for it. So uh Jen Higgins and I are here are, are remarking that you may have the ideal data set assuming you have access to all of these uh, to, uh, to conduct what are called P-technique factor analyses, intra-individual factor analyses, okay, right. get at exactly. Right. Yeah. So, so I don't know if you know well, that. Murphy, we're, we're doing a lot of within person randomization and we're using, we'll be using factorial and fractional factorial designs. Not sure if that's exactly No, no, no. This, this okay, is this uh, a Cattell type, a Raymond B. Cattell type analysis. I don't know it's an intra-individual factor analysis. Okay. So, uh, given my route to uh, eudaimonia, if we can have a scotch later, I can tell you, <laughs> I can draw a picture and show you. But you may have the ideal data set that would allow us to, for every individual, conduct a factor analysis and then do a tech, I'm going to be talking about this briefly tomorrow. A factor analysis of, of, of the individual. Yeah. Of the individual. It's called dynamic factor analysis. Looking at the time ordered factors that link that person's trajectory and yes. then using a technique called uh, the ideographic filter, seeing if there's any commonality at, at the more nomothetic level. And I've been looking uh, for a data set like this. Like forever, yeah. because if they don't exist. So, yeah. well, that's exciting. I, I'd be really interested in that. And one thing that is our challenge is to get people to use this app as many days as possible. Yes, that's um, really key. Yeah, and on average now, people are using it 11 days. That compares to 1.3 days from our original. But 11 company. days. But how many uh, data points per day do you have? Oh well, everything I showed you. You know, all of the daily. Uh, you know, alignment with these purposes, your your space, uh, you know, how much energy you have, how much willpower, and any other outcomes of interest. So, you know, the person can self-create those, as I talked about with Tourette's. You can create relationships with your spouse. You could create this for your own research project. You could create added screens to, to toss into this. So, yeah, there's a lot of potential for this. So this is an individual doing this on their own. Right. So one thing that we always talk about when we talk about purpose is we talk about the importance of community yeah. and belonging. Yeah. Um, can you talk us through why you chose not to in, in well, Actually, we have a lot of, no, we have real interest in that. So okay. the next step will be, and we're talking with AARP about this, to build a caregiver version of this. The idea of sharing your purpose with somebody is, is very cool. Yes. Or sharing your space. Like my mother is in a nursing home. She is 85. I want to share my purpose. I want to share my space. Mm -hmm. I, and I want her to share hers. And if she's not sleeping well, I want that pinging me on my app to say, your mom is, has not slept well for five days. And then I'll call her. So, and, and also you can set up social networks. If you give free additional apps to employees, for example, within that social network of an employer, you instantly have a social network. Then you can identify hubs and spokes of outcomes of interest and say, well, let's try you know, working on the, the hubs more. 
uh, things like that, or it's folks that are connecting others. So there, in other words, the Christakis and Fowler work on social networks yes. and how they act like viruses. Yes. And the idea of herd immunity, which is an epidemiologic concept where if you immunize 60% of a cattle herd, you can basically you're immunizing everyone, all the cattle, if you do it right, if you find the nodal points, you know, the, the hubs. You can do the same thing with all sorts of social memes and, and other things. Excellent. So, we're absolutely into that. Just we had to build the app first. Right. And now we have to sell it. So we're trying to do that. Just a quick question yeah. about, so it sounds like the new app uh, is sustained in people's active engagement for a longer period of time. Than Much longer, time. yeah. In fact, it's in the top 150 apps out of 1.6 million in the world. But, but you're saying around 11 days they stop? And what did they say? Why did they stop? Um, they, they get bored with it because it's the same information that's being collected. And the, even though the feedback evolves, and you've gotten data for 10 days. Now you're that box that says what makes you tick open, and they kind of know. So on average, people slow down. So what we're doing now, we're working with Susan Murphy to, what I want to do is personify it. I actually want to create a digital life coach with Jewel as an actual persona, where Jewel is asking questions, and not all the same questions every day. Just ask you a certain set of questions. Oh, and maybe, uh, Carol, you want to find out what your forecast is today, it's pretty good, but that type of thing. And maybe you, you haven't been sleeping well, so you only get a question or a couple of questions expanded on your sleep for that day. So it really becomes a life coach. Uh, it may not, for everybody, want to collect your purpose right away. Maybe it's collecting one or two of those. We have to figure out just what to give at the right time. I think Tevio once said, a little help at the right time is better than a lot of help at the wrong time. And so ideally, if you thought about this app as a matrix that's kind of standard right now, you could remove the tedium by breaking it apart temporally. And that's what we'll start doing in 2017. That making sense? Because we want people to use it longer. Yeah. They don't have to use it every day. I mean, how people use a health risk assessment. At Michigan, we're given a health risk assessment once a year, and we're all paid $100 in cash to take it. Like, what product do you have to pay people to take? It's so stupid. You know, it's like if you paid me $100 to drink this water, I probably would, but it's, why are you paying me? What's wrong with the water? Can it actually give you, like, real-time feedback in terms of how you improved over time? So it gives you the daily forecast. Can it say, like, oh, since you've been using this app? Yes. Well, there's a history component to it. You can look at it by week or by month or across a year. And then... And we're building a whole bunch of new features into it that relate to that kind of feedback. Normative feedback, I think, is really important. I think Jim Prochaska's work found that. I, I believe that Jim's work, the normative feedback of that trans theoretical model, was the best thing that he did. It's what kept people kind of involved. I want to see what other people are doing relative to me. So, yeah. Yeah. Have you considered this? Sorry, I'm talking too much. No, no, no. Um, the, developmentalists among us uh, might imagine that your app would apply differently for a 14-year-old who might be using it versus a middle adult who might be using it, and the ways in which they interact. And you may be able to do something about like it. Like I said, I know nothing about developmental. <laughs> <laughs> but but it, could, it could actually, I mean, in, in my mind at least, when yeah. I think about some of what you are asking for right up front is, what is your purpose? And you give them a little yeah. bit of help. But we just had a conversation about how, in many ways, it's not developmentally appropriate to be asking a 14-year-old to say, this is my purpose, even when given a, a list of them to give them an idea. But you can ask them I think that's values. one of the most important so you can questions to ask in this particular conference. Yeah. Do you, how do you generate and uh, nurture purpose as you're developing? And especially kids, I don't even know whether it's the right thing to do. I honestly don't. But I think there are ways that you can even use data you're collecting if you're yeah. intentional about understanding, I presume you are, how old they are yeah. and some different demographic factors. One thing I will tell you though, in college students, and I've given talks to thousands of college students now, every single person wants this app afterwards. They all want to use it. They want to put their purpose on Facebook and we'll connect. You know, we can connect all of those things really easily. So I see a lot of tests with colleges, I'm not sure high school is quite right. I've done enough talks in high schools that, where it doesn't seem to resonate in the same way. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure though. I, like I said, I don't know about kids. Um, I just want to interject to say 
unfortunately, again, um, for time, um, to move on, we need to take about a 10 minute break. And um, I know we did that point of the day when we were thinking about a lot of things now, processing a lot of what we've heard. But from our perspective of Pride, one of the most important things that we want to do is invite you to help answer questions, many of which are coming up in our, in our conversation right now and have been floating around during the lunch hour and different moments throughout the day. Um, in 10 minutes, we're going to launch a new activity and Rachel Sumner will walk us through what the activity involves. But it's a little bit more dynamic than sitting down and we want to kind of move around and be a little more interactive and she'll walk you through the different stages. But there's different things we want to do where we've shown up with questions, many of which are the things we're talking about right here and we hope that the answers that we didn't get a chance to share with the group, you'll do in this particular next segment. We want to try to provide answers to people who are literally waiting for folks like us to think about these things and answer some of these questions. So if you wouldn't mind, take a 10 minute break and uh, come back. And this is a really, really important part of what we want to do with this conference is get, pick your brains to answer some, some key questions for us.